The impacts of climate change touch even the smallest of creatures. Mia Vending is a researcher based in Greenland who studies zooplankton, organisms that can be microscopic in size. I spoke with Mia about their importance to the entire ecosystem. I traveled to Greenland, a country that's experiencing firsthand the effects of warming temperatures. Here in the Arctic, temperatures are warming three times faster than global warming. I spoke with Mia at the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources headquarters, where she leads the agency's climate research center. We always hear the expression canary in a coal mine. Is it zooplankton in the ocean that we should be talking about? I think we should talk about all the small things, all the ones we can't see, also all the things on the, on the sea bottom and all the things like, when you just look out the ocean, it's just this plain, and you know the species you know, but there's amazing life underneath there. Mia's research focuses on zooplankton. Those are small aquatic microorganisms that larger marine animals feed on. Sometimes called the insects of the sea, zooplankton play a key role in both marine and land animal life. You're fascinated with the tiny stuff. Can you talk about uh, your work in, in why it's so intriguing to you. Yes, that's true. I am, of course, I, I like watching a humpback whale swimming around in the fjords. They're beautiful, aesthetic uh, animals. I like to see the, the bigger, the polar bears and the seals. I appreciate those as well. But for my research, um, since the early days, I actually focused on all the small things, the zooplankton in, in the oceans. It's um, often when you talk with people and I ask them, our kids, I ask them to mention three three animals from the, from the ocean, they will mention all these big, beautiful animals. But as soon as they, they hear about these fascinating small creatures in the ocean, then they get really, uh, they're also really fascinating. Zooplankton is the, the food source for a lot of fish, larvae, fish species, and also for the humpback whales. The zooplankton is the reason why a humpback whale wants to swim all the way from Caribbean, all the way to Greenland every year, just to get the good food we have up here. So the Arctic zooplankton is very special because it contains a lot of fat. So it's full of fat inside because it has to survive the cold, cold winters. And that's what other, other species like. So they have this important link from the primate producers, like from all the things getting the energy from the sun and up to the higher traffic levels. So they're kind of connecting all these. And they have a fascinating. I started my work not in climate change, but in, in mating behavior and evolution of these uh, small things. And they are fascinating, I can promise you that. And zooplankton, are they being impacted? So as the climate gets warmer, as the fjords gets warmer, as the ocean gets warmer, we can see that the species, there's two solutions, three. You can either go extinct, you can die if you can't cope with the situation. You can- uh, Not the most desirable. Not the, the, most, <laughs> the most desirable, but, but that happens as well. We can see we had a warm inflow of water here in a couple of years and 50% of the phytoplankton species disappeared. Not the most important one, but still 50% of the species richness actually disappeared. So, so things are impacted by this. You can migrate if you don't like it here. You can, I can move to a warm place, I can go to Spain, or I can go to, to Italy and I like it. It's warmer than here. So that's also the thing species can do. If I don't like the temperature here, if it gets too warm for me, I can actually move northwards. And uh, the last thing you can do is to adapt and say, okay, this new temperature, I have to figure out how to, to work in that situation. So that's kind of the things, the three strategies animals have. And all the different kind of animals will react differently. But what we can see here, and that's also why it's so important to have this green, uh, gradient, is that what happens in, in the southern part of Greenland will be the case in the northern part at one point. Greenland's melting glaciers are among the main sources of global sea level rise. 2021 marked the 25th year in a row that Greenland's ice sheet shrunk, meaning it lost more mass during the melting season than it gained during the winter. That's according to the UN's World Meteorological Organization. They say that uh, what happens in Greenland doesn't stay in Greenland. What happens in the industrialized world doesn't stay there. You're, basically, both are impacted back and forth. How do you get across the sense of urgency about climate change? 
I think it's really important that, that we all remember that everything is connected. I think we quite a lot talks about what's, what's happening in the Arctic, um, but we need to be aware that everything is connected. So what's happening in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, but also that what happens in the rest of the world doesn't stay there either. I think we are very focused on talking about what happens in countries um, instead of what's happening on Earth. Greenland is dependent on imports for almost all of its goods, including some of its energy. Greenland's trying to become more sustainable and self-reliant by focusing on renewables. Currently, they make up about 70% of energy generated by the National Energy Company. But approval in 2021 of a new hydro power plant and an expansion of another could make it possible for Greenland to produce 90% of its power from renewable sources. I think we're looking quite a lot into like um, wind energy. I think here in Greenland it's different from the rest of the world because all of our electricity right now comes from uh, hydro planets. So we are already there where a lot of other countries is trying to get there. And we're also a country who wants to grow, so we also want new business. Um, we have recently banned all straws and uh, one-time uh, non-reusable uh, plastic things for the, for the industries. So I think we're actually getting there quite a lot. There's still a lot to be done into the garbage and into uh, our sewage system, but, um, but I think there's definitely things happening, and I think there's a great focus on that, that we are here. But a lot of the things we can't control, like all the deposits from the atmosphere, which goes up here and falls down. So it's, it's, again, it's a global, it's an international thing which, which kind of have to be decided. Four words came out of your mouth. You said, we want to grow, um, and, and that's apparent. We see cranes all over the place. Um, but growth also can produce a lot of issues. Uh, if you go to Iceland, uh, the, the tourism's been off the charts, and, and I have friends in Hawaii who complain about it. Um, Greenland's such a pristine, beautiful place. And there's so many people who are like, oh, that'd be a great place to go vacation. And I heard someone say, at some point, we're going to be able to have a, a, a airstrip where we can actually fly from New York to Greenland. And, you know, which New sounds, right yeah, New York to Newark is what they said. Uh, you know, that sounds great, but I, I think you recognize there can be downsides with that. What, what are your thoughts on that long term? Um. One of the things we see here, first of all, in Nuuk, as you see, there's cranes everywhere. That's one of the things that people are moving from the small villages to the main city. Um, in 2016, we were 16,000 people living here in Nuuk, and now this year we were 19,000. So within six years, we have actually grown quite a bit. So there's a huge need for building houses. Um, but on the other hand, all the small villages are disappearing. That's part of culture, it's part of history. So, so it's also, it's very different, and you see that, that in other countries as well, that you're moving to the big cities. With the newer airstripes, um, I hope that you will find a middle solution where you can be more financial, independent, um, but also still have your country intact. I, I have also been to Iceland. And I think it's a, a little bit too many tourists for my kind of taste. The difference between Iceland and here is this is a huge country. We are the size of going uh, most of Europe. Um, the Faroe Island can just be inside the Nukangsluor Fjord just outside my window. So it's a huge country. So having tourists here, you can kind of divide them over to a big area. In August 2022, the international NGO Arctic Circle held a meeting in Nuuk, Greenland's capital. Climate change and sustainability were central topics at the meeting. Mia was one of the speakers at the event. There were a lot of people here from a lot of different countries, 400 participants, I think 25 countries. Um, if there was a message you wanted to impart in them as they went out to the airport in Nuuk and flew off to all the various destinations, what was it and, and what were you hoping they'd walk away from the conference uh, thinking about? My message for the conference yesterday was that I hope that people know how to locally anchor knowledge within Greenland and not just to take knowledge away from us. We know we are interesting, we know we are a hot topic, we know we have a lot of visitors every year in the science uh, 
we uh, community and we know we are hot on the political agenda worldwide. However, you need to locally anchor knowledge within the country and not just take things away. Um, so I think that was my key message. And then to communicate also, because that's what we are actually really good at in our center is to collaborate and respect the local communities and has them as a site in our projects. My daughter uh, lived in Guyana for a time in a small little village, uh, cultural anthropologist. And one of the things that she got from the people living there was that oh, exactly what you were saying, a lot of researchers fly in, they have no understanding, they're there for a short period of time, they walk away, the most knowledgeable person about it. Whereas you live here, um, you experience it, you've been here for a lengthy period of time. There's, there's a major distinction to be made from uh, someone who parachutes into a community, as you say, extracts knowledge, leaves, versus someone like yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I think we are very fortunate. In, in theory, the Greenland Climate Research Center um, is actually financed from Danish side. But we have been in Greenland for that many years, and we live in Greenland, and we are part of the community that most people would see us completely as a Greenlandic institution. We are part of the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, where we are sitting right now, which is completely financed by the Greenland government. So we have been able to integrate ourselves really, really nicely within the Greenlandic society. However, we are also still, we are scientists. We are awful communicators. We, uh, we, we know I can talk hours about uh, zooplankton's uh, mating strategies or the impact of uh, pH or something like that. But, but being able to communicate that to your family or your the society or kids is a, is a completely different story. Um, <clears throat> I think we are doing the best. Another thing is that Greenland is huge and we are all here in Nuuk, the main capital. It's very different if you go out to the villages and stay there also for a long extended period of time. So they will also sometimes think that we fly in and fly out because we go back to Nuuk and, and it's just the main capital. Um, but I think the effort of being here, the effort of uh, involving, doing community-based research. And what is very different from my center is also that Normally you have all these natural scientists talking about natural science uh, things, but we actually also have social scientists in our department. So we work together with the social scientists and the natural scientists and the, uh, and the community to kind of evolve and develop these research questions. What is important for them to know? Where could we put our equipment? What would you kind of uh, uh, suggest? Where could be this? And, and, and also to kind of fit these things in. And I think just within Languages between natural science and social science is often two diff very different languages. And it's taken us many years to kind of understand each other and kind of come to a common goal about this. Um, but we are there now and, and, and this is our daily life. You know, you mentioned how complicated climate change is to explain to people, you know, one or two degrees, who cares? Um, I, it, it makes me think of COVID and, and uh, follow the science. And then after a while, it was like, I don't want to follow the science. Following the science is kind of a pain in the neck. And, um, and I think it's, it's kind of the same concept in the sense that COVID's invisible. You can't really see it. You, if you don't really know someone who's had it, well, I don't really think it's a thing. Climate change, I don't really, I like warmer weather. You, you see where I'm going with yeah, this. Yeah. How do you kind of change the conversation or how frustrating is that for you? I think one of the, th of course, it's, it's always frustrating when people don't believe in the same ideas as yours. But on the other hand, I think also we, we as a scientist have a really important job to kind of explain the science in a matter that other people understand. For a long time, we have been talking to peer reviewed uh, uh, journals, to other scientists, or we've been talking to um, to polit politicians who kind of know what we're talking about. But I think for scientists, it's very difficult to kind of communicate in a matter that other people actually understand. And I think with the new generations, we're actually getting better to that. Um, but yes, as soon as you either get COVID yourself or your family gets sick, then suddenly it's a worry for you. Or as soon as your basement is flooded, or the road you are going to is flooded, or the sea ice you are moving on is not there anymore, as soon as it's is impact you, of course, is, is a higher interest to you than anybody else. 
One of the things I also think as a scientist is most concerning is actually the effect that climate change has on biodiversity. We talk about climate change all the time, but I think actually the loss of biodiversity is, is as important as the rest of the things. We are losing so many species every day. We are changing the habitats. We are um, having new ship routes and, and all these things, all the, the things happening actually change the, biodiversity, the biodiversity around the world quite a lot. And I think that's also one of the things we have to be concerned about in the, in the future. Well, extend that out for us as well. I mean, once we start losing these species... They will not come back. And everything in the ecosystem have a function. So I went out yesterday with my, in the evening with my family. There was a lot of mosquitoes, and I really hate mosquitoes. But still, they have a function in the ecosystem. You can't just remove anything, something, and it will not have an effect up in the ecosystem. So when we, when we change things, when one, like with the cover pots, if we remove all the active cover pots up here, if we only have the Atlantic ones, the humpback whales would not come here. And, and all this kind of have a, a side effect in the ecosystems. And species move. So what happens in the Arctic doesn't just stay in the Arctic because the humpback whales is depending on, on how it is both in the Caribbean and, and how it's here on the way they, they move, how many ships do they meet on the way. The cod also move, migrate around, the salmon migrate. So, so the species move quite a lot around the world. So, so it's not just what happens here or what happens in, in, your, back, in your home country. It's a, it's a thing for the whole world. We are part of the same so I think you're a fascinating communicator and I can't thank you enough for talking to us today. Thank you very much.